Now, time to introduce uh, Dana Mila. Uh, Dana, welcome back home. And uh, uh, it's a big pleasure for me to introduce you. For those who don't know, Dana actually did a postdoc here with me. And, uh, but before that, she was also uh, an, an old UBC student. She did a BSc here at UBC in marine biology and then went off to Europe to Ireland and actually did a master's and PhD. And that is where she is based now, you know, sometimes school takes you somewhere and you never leave, right? So, <laughs> so that's your, your story, part of your story. Now, Dana, I, I don't, I have a long, uh, got this written up by Catherine kindly, but I'm not going to read the whole thing because you got her bio, Dana has been one of those. Again, I've been privileged to, to have in my lab and to work with, and, uh, and she just was amazing in terms of as a person, helping the lab to really flourish and linking up. She worked a lot with the Sea Around Us and other groups too, uh, um, Neros and Nippon Foundation. And she, she worked with all these groups and, and contributed a lot, did a lot of beautiful work, especially in the area of IUU fishing. Um, and here is the title, as you can see, the beauty of uh, Dana's work is how she took biology, combined it with economics, and then brought in the corporate sector into her research. Uh, like insurance companies, what do they do? Who do they finance? What does it mean for, for sustainability? And it's just amazing what you have done. Dana, thank you for all your work. And she doesn't only do research, she also uh, does communication and, and actually some advocacy, which is also one of the things scientists do today. She's appeared all over, including in the New York Times and Al Jazeera, her work and BBC, CBC. So hey, Dana, well done. And we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, over to you. Um, well, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Rashid, for that lovely, lovely introduction. Um, it's, it's lovely to, to speak to everyone today. Um, before I begin, I just want to, well, first of all, thank the organizers of this seminar um, series for inviting me. Um, yes, as Rashid said, I'm, I'm joining this call from um, my home office in Dublin, Ireland. Um, and we are here just a few weeks into our second lockdown of the year. Um, and as I understand, uh, Vancouver just recently entered into similar restrictions. So I just wanna take the opportunity, first of all, to say that I hope that you're all safe and healthy, um, both physically and mentally um, during these really exceptionally difficult times. Um, but despite, despite this, I'm, I'm very excited to be here today, um, to be speaking to you today. And the, the work that I'll be presenting um, began before I started working with Oceana. Uh, right now, I'm a, a senior policy advisor for Oceana in Europe, and uh, previously, as Rashid mentioned, I was a postdoc um, at UBC. And uh, when I was there, I was working with doctors uh, Rashid Samala, uh, Daniel Pauly, and Dirk Zeller um, on this particular topic. Um, and as such, I, I do realize that uh, uh, having the honor to give a presentation presentation during the seminar series is quite special. And it's particularly special for me because it's, um, it was actually just right after I gave my last presentation during the series, within the series, seven years ago now, um, that my journey with this uh, topic first began. Um, and at that time, I was studying IUU, IUU fishing. And the first thing I want to uh, explore, talk about is, is IUU fishing. Um, that term um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, although I realize probably a lot of you are um, being where you are at the Institute. But this stands for illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. And it's essentially the breaking or avoidance of fishing rules. And this can happen within um, coastal waters of a country, but it also can happen in internationally shared high seas waters. And we, we often use this term IUU fishing as a opposed to illegal fishing, um, because uh, some situations that take place on the high seas um, are not, illegal fishing is not really appropriate for describing them, such as when a fishing vessel is without nationality. And in this case, it would be unregulated fishing. Mm -hmm. IUU fishing is a globally pervasive and persistent problem. It contributes to the depletion of fisheries resources and to the destruction of marine resources worldwide. 
Um, it's often associated to other crimes and disproportionately impacts coastal communities in developing nations where, where fish stocks play a greater role in uh, maintaining food security and where resources for effective monitoring and control are limited. Um, importantly, um, given existing weaknesses in international frameworks for fisheries governance, IUU fishing is an incredibly difficult issue to tackle and innovative um, approaches are, are badly needed to overcome these challenges. So as I mentioned, I was studying IUU fishing um, at UBC about seven years ago. And after speaking on this topic um, in this seminar series, Daniel uh, approached me afterwards with a question. And this question was also of interest to a, a particular donor, the, the Waterloo Foundation. And that question was, is there a link between marine insurance and IUU fishing? And it proved to be a very important question as I've been striving uh, to find this link, describe it and, and use it um, strategically in my advocacy work, cam campaign work um, within Oceana ever since. So why is this question um, so important and, and how can insurance be relevant in efforts to combat IUU fishing? Well, it starts with understanding that fishing is an economic activity. And like with any activity, when deciding to um, whether or not to engage in it, the costs and benefits of that activity are weighed against each other. Now, obviously, uh, this is a highly simplified, um, or sorry, if the, if the net benefit is positive, fishing theoretically should continue. And if it's negative, um, fishing should stop. As I said, uh, this is obviously a, a very simplified, um, highly simplified representation of this equation, but, and there are other, many other factors that um, could be incorporated. But considering IUU fishing, it's also an economic activity. And just like with legal fishing, um, those that participate weigh the benefits against the costs. And with IUU fishing, there are additional factors um, that also are included in, within this equation. Um, such as the total expected penalty paid. And this incorporates um, the probability of getting caught, the cost of fines, um, factors that have all been contemplated and examined in depth by Rashid, actually in a paper he published with co-authors in, in 2006. But taking a preventive, a pre pre the, a preventative approach um, towards tackling this problem, IUU fishing, we can ask um, how can we tamper with this, uh, with the economics of IUU fishing to decrease the incentive to participate? Because all entities um, that contribute to this equation have the ability to modify it. And looking to insurance, um, it can also be part of this equation as it's a service that's provided to vessel owners that offers financial protection um, should an unexpected accident occur. So ultimately, we wanted to investigate what role insurance and insurers have within this equation for those that seek um, to, to engage in IUU fishing. Because if IUU fishers seek insurance services, removing access to these services should theoretically decrease the incentive um, or increase the financial risk of engaging in IUU fishing. So, Working with Rashid, uh, Daniel, Dirk, and a number of others that supported this work, um, including the Norwegian nonprofit um, organization Trigmat Tracking, we set out to identify whether there was a link between insurance and IUU fishing. Um, and in the process, we learned about policies and procedures within the insurance industry that could potentially be um, influencing the accessibility of insurance products to IUU fishing vessel owners and operators. And through our investigations, we found evidence of insurance policies for 67 um, fishing vessels known for their involvement in IUU fishing. And I should note here that IUU fishing vessels um, also incorporates refrigerated cargo vessels and other, um, other supply ships that support um, the activities of the, the fishing vessels themselves. And even high profile, notoriously persistent IUU fishing vessels were found to be linked to internationally reputable insurance um, firms. For example, the Bandit Six, um, we were a group of vessels that had been featured heav heavily in the media a few years back. Um, they were known for engaging in IUU fishing activities in the Southern Oceans, in particular targeting um, Patagonian toothfish. 
And they had all been listed on the official IUU vessel lists of regional fisheries management organizations. Not only this, um, but for five of them, Interpol had issued purple notices for them, um, seeking information on their activities and whereabouts. And through the research that we conducted at UBC, we found out that all of these, all six of these, were insured by a reputable UK-based um, marine insurance company. And we received a lot of media attention um, when we published this research in 2016, which is uh, actually a great way to start an advocacy campaign, which is precisely what happened next. So in 2016, I, I left UBC and I started working with Oceana in Europe. And conveniently, Oceana um, was also aware of this link to insurance from a number of IUU fishing cases in, involving Spanish nationals. So it, was, it really was a perfect match. Um, assisting the monumental work of Guarda Civil, um, the Spanish Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, Interpol, Sea Shepherd, and many others, Oceana was at the time um, involved in several court cases in Spain against infamous Spanish fishing company, Vidal Armadores. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> My Spanish is not great. Um, and associated companies and individuals, Spanish nationals were, that were found to be the beneficiaries of IUU fishing and other related crimes. And charges were laid on the basis of environmental crime, forged documentation and money laundering. The vessels involved in this ca these cases were insured and the discovery of an insurance contract and the details contained therein um, was pivotal in pr um, prompting judicial, judicial processes in Spain. This story, unfortunately, does not have a fully satisfactory ending, however, as the criminal court case that Oceana was involved with was ultimately lost. Administrative fines were laid, but the criminal court case was lost. In any case, um, after I joined Oceana, we promptly launched a campaign aiming to directly engage with the insurance industry, promoting underwriting practices that could reduce access to insurance by IUU um, fishing vessel owners. We also joined an initiative um, of the UN Environment Program. This is the Principles for Sustainable Insurance. Um, and through this initiative, uh, companies that sign up to it um, are essentially uh, promising to abide by the principles, which is encouraging um, sustainable practices, business practices within the insurance sector. But in order to get insurers to engage with us, to listen, um, we had to convince them to care. Um, obviously, on a human level, um, one should want to do the right thing and then stop illegal destructive activity, but these are large companies and to convince them to divert time and resources to this, uh, to change their practices, we, we had to effectively argue that this is bad for business. So why should insur insurers care? Well, first, um, insurers should care for legal reasons. And since this work began, the regulatory, uh, the international regulatory framework um, has, uh, sorry, the international regulatory landscape has changed significantly. Four regional fisheries management organizations, um, I'll refer to this term a, a number of times throughout the presentation, they are RFMOs, um, with mandates to manage internationally shared fish stocks or areas, have recently introduced rules requiring that member countries take action if any of their nationals are found to be supporting IUU fishing, including explicitly through the provision of insurance. So that word insurance is included in, in these rules in, within, within the RFMOs. And for companies based in the European Union, since 2008, a regulation has been in place stating that nationals, including companies, shall not support nor engage in IUU fishing. And this article has really been so important for our work. Um, and early on, we sought uh, confirmation from the European Commission that the interpretation of support did indeed include the provision of services, including the provision of insurance services. So it's very powerful to be able to go to a company and say that this is a, a legal requirement. Um, and it's also very convenient because the, the bulk from our experience, the bulk of marine insurers are, are based in, in Europe um, and even so within the London market. Not that EU regulations are relevant to the UK market anymore, but, um, but similar legislation is in place within the UK. 
So why else, um, why else should insurers care? But they, they should also care because the characteristics um, that are typical of IUU vessels also make them at a higher risk of being involved in accidents. And this can lead to an increased likelihood of claims. In addition, these same characteristics may facilitate other criminal or socially unjust activities, like human traffic trafficking, um, document forgery, uh, money laundering, etc. And importantly, association to IUU fishing or any illegal activity is embarrassing and potentially reputationally damaging. And lastly, um, facing apprehension, vessel owners or operators may opt to scuttle their vessel and make a fraudulent insurance claim. And we've uh, seen examples of this, which we've shown to companies to really make this point. And one particular astonish astonishing example is of the Thunder. The Thunder is infamous. It's a, a very famous IUU fishing vessel. It was listed on two RFMO IUU vessel lists and Interpol had issued a purple notice for it. She had known association to at least two insurance companies from 2014 until um, April 2015, when she sunk off the coast of uh, Sao Tome and Principe, 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 sorry, can't pronounce that. <laughs> uh, Principe, <laughs> um, anyways, after being pursued for three and a half months by the Bob Barker, a vessel owned by the um, environmental organization Sea Shepherd. The vessel allegedly sunk under suspicious circumstances and observers that boarded the craft immediately before it sank claimed that hatches and doors were left open, tied open, suggesting that the crew had rigged the vessel to sink quickly. Following the sinking incident, it was reported on a Norwegian news article um, that the owners of the Thunder had filed an insurance claim for the value of the ship, but the claim was rejected. Um, in October of 2015, three Spanish officers that were on board the Thunder at the time of its sinking were sentenced to three years in jail, each for recklessness and forgery and have been fined 15 million euros for charges relating to pollution and damage to the environment. Damage to the environment because they sunk their own ship. <laughs> so this is an example of uh, you know, insurance fraud that, that can be common with IUU fishing vessels. Another example is of the, the Tiantai and the Chody Erden. Uh, the Tiantai was also listed on two RFMO IUU vessel lists. And uh, this vessel, the Tiantai, had also been linked to Vidal Armadores. Um, this is the Spanish ship owning company that I mentioned previously. Spain imposed fines on Vidal Armadores, six other companies, and seven individuals for supporting the activities of the Tiantai and three other IUU vessels through a network of businesses in Spain and abroad. And in March of 2014, Australian search and rescue authorities detected an emergency signal 350 nautical miles um, north of the Antarctic mainland. Australia was unable to establish communication and upon arrival at the location where the signal was detected, debris was found, but the vessel and crew were never located. The Spanish media reported that an insurance claim was made, um, was filed by the owners of the Tiantai following the incident, and 6.3 million euro was successfully awarded, successfully awarded uh, for the, the sinking of this IUU fish, uh, IUU um, vessel. And that award was uh, compensating for the loss of the vessel and the cargo, the cargo being IUU caught fish. So perhaps the insurance Sure was unaware of the status of this vessel on international IUU um, vessel lists, or perhaps they were aware, um, but did not interpret the um, IUU activities, the unregulated activities rather than illegal activities of the vessel to be in breach of policy that would otherwise void the claim. In any case, the money was transferred um, from the insurer to the owner of the Tiantai. And again, the, the Spanish media reported that this money was then reinvested in the purchase of a new vessel, the Chody Erden, um, the vessel on the right, a fishing vessel with a clean record, essentially whitewashing the profits of IUU fishing. But the story doesn't end, end there um, because in September of 2015, the Chody Erden sank in the Gulf of Guinea. And this time the crew was rescued from a support boat, but not until several hours have pa had passed. 
again, an insurance claim was made, um, was filed. And, and for this one, I'm not certain of the outcome um, because to my knowledge, no further um, public information is available. So I can't, I can't tell you how that ends up. But these are just a few examples of um, you know, stories that we do use and we talk to insurers about. And thankfully our arguments um, supplemented by these few powerful case studies were convincing. We built relationships with insurance companies and working with the PSI initiative that Principles for Sustainable Insurance Initiative through the UN. Oceana facilitated the development of an insurance industry statement against IE fishing that was launched at the Our Ocean Conference, um, the 2017 Our Ocean Conference in Malta. And signatories to this statement have agreed to not insure officially blacklisted IUU fishing vessels and to encourage the adoption and use of, of modified risk management procedures. To date, the statement has been signed by over 30 leading insurers, insurance market bodies, and key stakeholders around, from around the globe, not, not, just, not just the European market. And through improving due diligence processes and depriving IUU fishing vessels access to insurance, these companies are altering the economics of um, IUU fishing. But they're also sending a clear message um, to those that steal from our oceans, to IUU fishing vessel owners and operators, that they're not welcome in the financial marketplace. But we couldn't stop our efforts um, here, though. Um, so through speaking with insurers, we realized that it was it may not be easy for them, um, not familiar with IUU fishing, fishing in general. Um, to identify an IUU fishing vessel or even know what IUU fishing is. So for this reason, again, um, in collaboration with UN Environment's uh, Principles for Sustainable Insurance and with input from industry stakeholders, Oceana facilitated the development of a guidelines booklet that was published last year in 2019. And this booklet provides guidance on how to identify and avoid contracts with IUU fishing vessels. It also provides recommendations for policies that if broadly implemented um, by the marine insurance sector can increase transparency and accountability amongst global fishing fleets. And this guidance was written um, and framed in a way that assists underwriters, risk, ma risk managers, um, agents, brokers, and other relevant parties in managing risk relating to this issue. Um, the meat of this booklet therefore is in the risk control options provided. So first, we ask insurers to consult um, the IUU fishing risk assessment checklist. And this checklist is included in the booklet and provides an easy way to quickly evaluate whether a vessel is at a higher risk of being involved in IUU fishing. All of these things um, you know, are, are red flags for involvement in IUU fishing. You know, if a vessel changes its name multiple times in a short period of time, if it uh, changes its flag, um, if it uh, doesn't have an IMO number, a number that stays with it throughout its life. Um, these are all red flags that this, this vessel is avoiding um, efforts to track it, to, to identify it. And um, we were realizing that insurers maybe were not aware of, of some of these characteristics that are common of IUU fishing vessels. Um, second, we ask companies to deny insurance to vessels engaged in IUU fishing, and these would be any vessels that have been placed on the international IUU vessel lists of RFMOs. And guidance is provided in the booklet on where to find these lists online, um, but we also generally refer companies to TrigMap Tracking's um, combined IUU vessel list, which is a user-friendly, up-to-date repository of information on officially uh, listed IUU fishing vessels. Third, we recommend that companies consider introducing policy wording that explicitly excludes coverage of vessels engaged in IUU fishing and their catch. And this is very important because policy wording may currently um, exclude coverage of illegal activities, but the unregulated form of IUU fishing may not be considered. And this was highlighted in that case that I um, described earlier of the, the Tiantai, which actually was um, involved in unregulated activity rather than um, straightforward illegal activity. 
And companies can also consider the reputation of the vessel's flag in their risk assessment. Here, we've advised them to pay attention to the use of flags of convenience, which is when a vessel owner uh, chooses to register their vessel in, a, in a, the flag of a country that bears no association to the owner. Um, we've also asked them to pay attention to instances where vessels are owned by shell companies and treat these vessels with greater scrutiny. And lastly, lastly, but possibly most importantly, we have asked companies uh, to consider encouraging the use of publicly accessible vessel tracking systems and unique vessel identifiers, such as the IMO number by all fishing vessels they insure. Because fishing, um, vessel tracking and IMO numbers are not international legal requirements for fishing vessels, the global fishing sector is highly opaque and IUU fishing vessels are essentially able to hide in the shadows of this sector, um, concealing their identities and evading enforcement efforts. So if insurance companies were to require these, it would be a win-win situation with insurers having greater visibility over their clients to assess risk, and at the same time, increasing transparency within the fishing sector to assist monitoring, control, and surveillance efforts. So if widely adopted, um, not only by insurers, but other businesses that provide services to global fishing fleets, these measures could potentially help to bring about transport, transformational change within the fishing sector. So we also refer com companies to the free and publicly accessible um, web-based platform, Global Fishing Watch, where vessels that are equipped with and use um, AIS tracking technology can be located and monitored. Now, you might be wondering at this stage, are any of these efforts working? Um, is IUU fishing losing support from in the insurance sector and is this having an impact? Well, unfortunately, it, this is, it's a difficult question to answer, um, but there are some positive indications that keep us motivated and, and some exciting developments in the pipeline. I should say that this is a difficult question to answer because um, for those of you who are familiar with IUU fishing, um, we really don't have a great baseline um, understanding of the, the extent of this activity. It's unreported, it's unregulated, it's occurring in the shadows. So we really don't know, we don't have a good grasp of exactly how much is going on. As I mentioned earlier, the fishing industry generally is opaque. So um, it's very difficult to, to measure the impact of efforts to reduce IUU fishing when, when we don't know how much is occurring to begin with. Um, but as I said, there are some positive um, indications that the work that we're doing is having an impact. And I wanna highlight two cases for you as they really are um, quite exciting and, and recent for us as well. So these two vessels uh, were both added to the IUU vessel lists of RFMOs uh, within the last several years. And following their listing, we were able to identify the insurers of both of these vessels and we requested that cover immediately be canceled. In both instances, the vessels lost their insurance and we alerted our network informing other companies to deny cover coverage if approached. And as of October of this year, both of these, these vessels had been seized and the Kabija on the right is currently detained in the port of Yemen, while the Uthaiwan is on the left is now in a breakout in Bangladesh. Now, Quite obviously, the, um, the efforts of the enforcement officials and others that assisted in tracking and arresting these vessels should be commended above all else. However, it's, it's plausible to think that we also played a minor role in this through um, weakening or frustrating the, the vessel owners and operators, um, taking away their, their insurance coverage. Regardless, these cases, as well as the knowledge that our changes, uh, that changes are broadly being adopted within the sector give us the motivation to continue our campaign efforts. And we are continuing this campaign. Um, before the end of the year, we're re reconvening the signatories to the statement um, that was originally launched in 2017 um, because we wanna check in on which tools and strategies are actually being used and, and whether these are fit for purpose. We are also aiming to promote wider adoption of effective due diligence strategies um, not only within the insurance sector, but also by other companies that provide services to global fishing fleets. Basically, anyone who has the ability to support 
facilitate or benefit from IUV fishing, um, we, you know, we want to get in touch with them and, and, and start engaging with them. We believe that working with injurers is having an impact, um, but the impact can be much broader. It can be, as I said, it can be truly transformational in the fight um, against IUV fishing if more companies and other sectors join in um, in efforts to cut off services to these vessels, push them out of the financial marketplace, um, and adopt policies that encourage transparency and accountability. So to conclude, I'd just like to thank um, UBC. I'd like to thank Rashid, Daniel, Dirk, um, all of my colleagues at Oceana and anyone else listening that supported this work through the various stages over the last seven years. Um, and I'd also like to, um, to thank the Waterloo Foundation for the depths of support and guidance that they've provided over the years, um, as well as the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who's currently supporting this work, and the EU's Life Program for supporting the work of Oceana in Europe. And I'd also like to thank all of you out there um, in cyberspace for listening to me um, over here in Ireland. Um, and I welcome you all to reach out to me um, through the contact details provided on the screen and please visit Oceana's website for more information on our campaigns. So thanks everyone and I'll gladly take any questions you might have. Yeah, so. Thank you so much Dana. Oh Rashid, you were going to jump yeah, ahead. Go ahead. After Q&A, you go, go ahead please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you so much for um, your really interesting presentation and for um, making a really important link between how we can under better understand um, IU fisheries and link it to the finance sector, which I think finance sector is becoming increasingly important and um, you know its role in IU fishing is, is certainly a really important segment of that. Um, so I encourage everyone to um, enter their questions in the chat box and um, I'll start since we're waiting for those to come through. Um, I was going to ask you what's, um, you know, Obviously, this is an important, like the, finding out about the insurance from, you know, like your side of things. So through the Oceania work is really important. And so I was just wondering in terms of making that information potentially accessible to a wider diversity of people, is that something that you see as a possibility or that there's some strings attached just because there's some sensitivities around the type of data? Um, I'm just curious about that because we work on IAU fisheries and some of the work that I do and insurance is certainly a very important segment. Um, but yeah, like there, there are some, some sensitivities associated with that. So I was just wondering where your thoughts are at on that. Thank That's you. a very good question. Um, and it's something that we've dealt with from the very beginning when we did our research at UBC. Um, I mean, through that research, we of course were able to find links between specific vessels and specific companies. Um, which we could have named um, in the article that we published. Um, at the time, we didn't. And I think there were a few different reasons for that. Um, the first one being a uh, fear of uh, lawsuits. <laughs> uh, you know, any, you know, if we're, we're putting information out there accusing companies of association to um, illegal activity, sometimes criminal activity, it's, it's strong allegations. So, um, just to avoid any possibility of that, it's an easier way to just not name the companies. Um, at the time, I think we also felt that um, that it wasn't a, a game of name and shame. That wasn't the objective of the paper that we published. It was to describe the patterns that we we're seeing, and um, you know, just to describe the relationship between illegal fishing and and uh, marine insurance. Um, but there is another reason as well. Um, and I don't know if we knew that at the time that this was eventually going to turn into an advocacy campaign, um, but I am I'm quite glad that we didn't, you know, go out naming and blaming companies at the beginning because if we had done that, um, it would have been much more difficult to work with them, um, you know, to gain their engagement, to gain their trust. Um, trust has been a very important thing um, throughout this whole process. Um, I do genuinely believe that, I, I hesitate saying the majority, but I, I do genuinely believe that um, the majority of these companies weren't aware of the link between um, their business and IUU fishing activity. I think that, that this was a very new thing for them. So to immediately go out and embarrass them and you know have them deal with the repercussions of reputationally damaging information, um, 
it, it just uh, maybe wasn't quite fair without giving the, them the opportunity to respond first. So, I mean, that, that's an explanation of how I've decided to deal with it and we've decided to deal with it, those that I've been working with. Um, but that being said, I think transparency is incredibly important. So, um, you know, a balance needs to be found <laughs> over, you know, the, the information that's released and, and whether this information can be helpful. Um, I would definitely encourage, you know, greater transparency over non-transparency, but, you know, the, the path that we chose to, to go forward with this work, um, you know, we, we did choose to keep that information confidential. Thank you. I, okay, I'll, I'll jump ahead and I'll ask the first question. Um, I have a question from Amanda. Um, it's about the links with um, IWT. Sorry, Amanda, maybe you can elaborate in the chat a little bit more about that and then I'll, I'll follow up on that. Um, in the meantime, Gabriel, go ahead and ask the next question. So from a question from Rashid, I think Rashid, since you can, you can even say your question out loud since you can un unmute. Okay, so all right, you give me that. Okay, so so then I thank you for the talk, and uh, I really enjoyed how you took your research all the way to application and impact. And to me, that is what I like to see in our our, our research. You know, and, and what we do, you don't just publish and go to sleep. You find a way to make it really have an impact, and you you've shown us how to do this. Now. Did you face any obstacles? What are the challenges of doing that? Do you have any advice for those of us who want to follow your example? Probably the earliest challenges was communication. Um, you know, coming from the world of academia, I was used to using big words and long, long, lengthy explanations and massive emails, which is not really that effective when you are trying to communicate with um, someone in the you know, someone in the private sector who doesn't have a lot of time to be reading your essays. Um, so, I mean, that was one, one challenge. I had to adjust the way that I communicated. Um, you know, I, I had to not get so hung up on all of the minor little details and, um, and try to communicate things in a simple way, but really carrying the, the, the main message in as concise way as possible. Um, so, you know, that was a challenge for sure. Um, aside from that, I, I felt as though the transition was quite smooth um, for me. I, I, I completely agree. I think, I mean, it's been very rewarding for me to be able to take research to a different phase and do something with it. Um, that being said, I, I do also miss, you know, being at the beginning stages of the process. Um, I think it's important to, to, you know, to see um, both sides of the process because it can, you know, when you're, when you're talking to people, when you're advocating for something and, and you saw the very beginning of that journey, um, there's a real kind of genuine place that those messages come from. And I think that really carries through. So um, yeah, I've really enjoyed this process and I would really, you know, um, uh, encourage others to, to pursue a similar path or at least to think about the, um, you know, the, the results, your research, your findings, and consider whether this can be helpful for a nonprofit um, or, you know, for a policymaker. Um, where can this information go to, to actually bring about some change in this world, some positive change? Apparently, I've been, it's Amanda speaking, apparently I've been unmuted to ask my question, Dana, so that's very wonderful. I'm glad to talk to you. Um, I'm really interested in the convergence between the growing commitment to ending illegal wildlife trade and the growing commitment to ending IUU fishing. Um, the Basel Institute on Governance is working quite hard now on an illegal wildlife trade initiative um, coming from United for Wildlife, which is a royal foundation, a royal initiative in the UK. And their approach on this is pushing at banking. So they were calling me this week specifically to talk about how we could engage on the marine side of illegal wildlife trade to accelerate 
um, action through the banks where we would try to provide specific evidence to the banks and the banks would then make decisions that would cover all sorts of their clients, which would include insurance companies, of course, <clears throat> as well as shipping companies and no end of other um, agents. And I'm curious as to whether um, you've reached out into these huge initiatives on IWT, which are increasingly engaged with marine species. And, you know, there's some very interesting links there. I, I just discovered, for example, that donkey skins are now being used to smuggle marine wildlife all over the world. So the banking emphasis would, I think, complement your insurance emphasis really beautifully. And by the way, I love the talk. I forgot to say that. It was great. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. It's really, really good to hear from you. <laughs> oh, it's a shame that I can't be there in person because I, you know, uh, these voices are- We're all not there in person either, Dana. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I mean, it's it's a shame that we all can't be there in person, I suppose. Um, yeah, the, um, that point you raised is very, uh, a very important one, a very good one. Um, you know what, I the whole fish wildlife thing, I, I it always confuses me because fish are wildlife. So, you know, I, I feel like there should be a lot more um, collaboration and, um, you know, similar um, joining of initiatives. Um, I'm not familiar with the, the, the work that you mentioned, but um, I'll certainly look into it further. But um, I'm thinking, I mean, thinking about banking and IUU fishing, it is something that we're starting to explore a little bit. Um, we've just recently, I say we, Oceana, has just recently joined um, a new UN initiative called the uh, Blue Economy, um, sorry, the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Initiative, um, which is fully focused on marine issues and it incorporates more than just insurance, it's other aspects of finance, um, banking as well. And right now this initiative is in the process of developing guidance. Um, so I, th I think, you know, what you're talking about with wildlife trade um, with marine species, there's certainly an opportunity there to bring that into the discussion. And, and I hope very much that it is gonna get incorporated in the development of this guidance. Um, but one thing to say about banking that is, I mean, because we're thinking right now in Oceana about what other sectors can we engage with? Um, you know, what other, what other sectors can we use a similar approach with um, and try to engage with them and mo mobilize them and, and change practices to make it more difficult for IEU fishing vessels to um, access these services? Banking is a difficult one because, um, I mean, insurance is quite opaque. Uh, we were very lucky with um, our research in that we found out, uh, pretty much stumbled upon it within the whole World Wide Web, um, insurance companies, uh, specifically protection and indemnity insurance providers that, were, uh, that had search engines on their website where you could look up a specific vessel um, and you could find whether that vessel was insured. Now, this is only one particular type of insurance. Um, for other insurance uh, contracts, uh, the information is confidential and it's very difficult to find these relationships. In banking, um, it's certainly much more confidential and it's very difficult, um, at least to my experience and, and the, those I've spoken to, to, to find um, relationships between illegal activity and um, specific banks. Um, and this creates an issue when you're trying to you know, find a point of leverage. Um, obviously, it can be very helpful if you, you, know, you can find a, a tie to a specific illegal activity, an illegal vessel, um, to a specific financial institution, and then you go to that institution with that example, and you say, okay, we have a problem. Can you, can you do something? Can you change? Um, with banking, it, it, this is an issue because it's just so difficult to find those examples, in my experience anyways. Um, but as I said, there, there's, you know, there's great momentum right now in this area of a sustainable blue economy. Um, and these institutions are becoming much more involved, much more engaged in these issues. So I think there is hope in, in implementation of you know, positive measures that, that could uh, reduce some of these activities um, without needing that leverage and, and finding um, case examples of their involvement. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> I hope I addressed your question. There is a question from Robert Humphries. How do you think IEU fishing activities, activities will adapt to get around this marine insurance measure? Sorry, can you repeat the question? How do you think IEU fishing activities 
will adapt to get around this marine insurance measure. Ah, how will they adapt to get around um, the marine insurance? Um, <sighs> that's a good question. It just depends on how, um, I mean, if we remove access to insurance by certain providers, then they'll look for other providers who, who you know, aren't aware of IUU fishing and aren't doing uh, due diligence as well and are willing to provide insurance coverage. So this is why we're trying to be as um, you know, comprehensive as possible and, and trying to reach as many companies as possible. So they're all aware of this and they're all um, you know, in, in improving their due diligence processes to, to make sure that there isn't any um, you know, convenient companies out there that, that, that can, they can turn to. Um, you know, if a scenario where every insurance company in the world is turning down um, IUU fishing, uh, vessels and then I mean there is um, a vessel needs to be insured in order to gain access to other services or enabled to, to operate in certain ways or gain access to ports in certain circumstances circumstances so in that sense the removal of insurance um, you know it, it makes them more or less able to operate so um, so I'm kind of stumbling around an answer to this question I, I really hope that um, you know, this, this does it have an impact and they won't find a way of, you know, um, of lessening the impact, I suppose. Uh, but this, again, is also another reason why we want to expand these efforts to um, incorporate not just insurance, but other service providers. Um, just making it increasingly difficult for these guys to operate, um, to get access to various different services, not just insurance, and um, gradually, maybe they'll, they'll find that it's, it's just not worth it anymore. Thank you, Dana. And I have a question from Ana Santo. Um, she congratulates you on an amazing presentation and uh, really fantastic work. And her question is, as you have explored this topic, have you come across examples in other industries, not just fishing, where insurance companies are insuring illegal, unreported or unregulated activities? Good question. Um, so I haven't done any research myself <laughs> into other areas, so I can't really speak on that. But um, I mean, we are involved, I, I mentioned in the presentation that Oceana is a supporting institution to the uh, UN Environments Program uh, called the Principles for Sustainable Insurance. And in this uh, whole initiative, um, they focus on well, I mean, marine is only actually a recent focus of theirs, but they, they focus on many other issues. Um, the issues are more relating to kind of the sustainability. There's a bit really strong focus on climate change. Um, there's a really strong focus also on health, um, you know, divesting um, investment from coal, from tobacco. Um, but in terms of other illegal activity, um, I haven't really heard another initiative within that space that really is focusing on on other illegal activity. So, I mean, I haven't I haven't investigated it myself, but um, you know, I haven't. I, I mean, the short answer is I haven't come across anything. But it, but that's not to say it's not out there. Can I can I push in one question? Are we at the end of the questions on the chat? We are not at the end. No, there's lots more, and we'll make sure to send. Oh, those. Shut up. You go on, go on, go ahead. It's all right. Um, I was just going to quickly say that yes, there's lots of questions, which is really great, and those that we don't have a chance to ask you here, we'll make sure to send to you so you can follow up. Um, go ahead, Gabriel. So there was a, <clears throat> a question from Spencer Chasen. How does the life of most IU, IU vessel end? Is by sinking an insurance claim, selling or decommissioning, recycling? Um, and then the, 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 please answer to that part and I will ask you the second part of that question. Well, it's, I mean, it's really interesting. You can actually, um, I referred in my presentation to um, Trigmat Tracking's website, iuuvessels.org. IUU um, and on that website, you can see um, all of the vessels that have been listed by RFMOs, regional fisheries management organizations. 
And the site is really good because they provide a very thorough history of the vessels and also a history of the listing, how long ago these vessels were listed. And it's astonishing. Some of these vessels have been listed for, you know, 20 years and they're still out there <laughs> fishing or maybe they're, you know, in a, you know, they're decommissioned and they're in some kind of a port somewhere rusting away. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, a lot of these are, they just continue operating until they uh, are run to the ground or, and, and what we're seeing examples of um, are purposeful scuttling of vessels. Um, you know, when ve vessels are deliberately <laughs> sunk. Um, and I mean, there, there's not really proof of it, but you can kind of guess that maybe in some situations that they're trying to, I mean, that, that this vessel can't get access to ports because it's been blacklisted. And, uh, you know, this is an effort to retain the value of the vessel through, through an insurance claim. Um, I won't say that, you know, all IUU vessels reach their end by purposely sinking themselves. Um, but there certainly are a couple of cases like that. Um, but yeah, they just uh, continue operating until they're caught. Um, if they're caught by the Indonesian authorities, then they might be blown up. <laughs> um, is that Indonesia? Yes. And then um, then other ones, uh, you know, they could just be rusting away somewhere because they're, they're, you know, they've reached the end of their life and they never got caught, but they're, they're not being used anymore. And the second part of the question is, this increase in regulation for end of life will also put more cost and tracking pressure on the AU business. Does this really help? Sorry, could, could you say that question again? I'm not sure if I this, understood it. This increase in regulation for end of life will also put more cost and tracking pressure on IU business model. Does this help? In Sorry, I still don't understand it for some reason. It's fine. There is oh. another question. Okay. Um, from jo Joanne Bainey. How do you think, how do you find the insurance company to work with? Are they receptive to working to combat this issue or only doing it because of the financial or reputation implication? Do they have ethic policies for their business? That is a great question. Um, because it's changed it's really changed over time um i had i was lucky in that i first started interacting with these companies when i was a researcher at ubc um so i don't think i was as intimidating as i am now um you know as a representative for an, an ngo and advocacy organization that you know can occasionally take the tactic of naming and shaming. Um, so I think when I first engaged with these companies, um, uh, it was easier to talk to them um, wearing an academic's hat uh, because it wasn't, you know, there wasn't the same sort of threat. Um, that being said, I would say that early on in this process, um, there was a, a much greater re reluctance to, to be open-minded to, to talking to me about this, um, you know, and, insurance companies really, it felt as though there wasn't a strong interest in sustainability. Um, those that I was speaking to anyways, especially in the marine insurance world, um, you know, they didn't feel like it was part of their, their mandate to, um, you know, to ensure that they were doing things in a sustainable way. It was frustrating because <laughs> they saw what I was talking about as a sustainability issue, not as a, you know, issue of illegality, um, which was quite frustrating. But that being said, now, um, six years later, since we first started engaging with them, things have dramatically changed. And I think that's in part because the world is changing and you know, it's, it's harder for uh, the private sector to ignore <laughs> um, that they do have a role to play and um, you know, they need to be making responsible, sustainable choices. Um, as part of, you know, normal business practice. Um, it needs to be part of their mandate because, um, you know, a future that, like a non-sustainable future is bad for business. It's um, illegal fishing is bad for business. Um, but it, it did take a while um, for, for companies to kind of open, open their ears to this and, and be more receptive to what we were saying. But as I said, I think that's really changing now. It's, it's definitely changing now. 
particularly as uh, these initiatives, those that I've mentioned, you know, there's more and more of these cropping up. And um, I think some businesses are definitely taking advantage of it to promote themselves. Um, it's, it is a bit of a PR machine as well, but uh, I do, I also feel that there's some very, very good work, um, important work that's being done. So thank you so much, uh, um, Dana. And as I said, uh, the beauty of your work is how you move from from biology to economics to business and how you move from research to application and advocacy and getting things that I think is an excellent example uh, of how we should all actually, what we should aim to do with what we do. So thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, on behalf of our Institute, we are grateful to have you back to see you succeed and doing amazing work.